Hello, this is Danny from CMS. Today we're going to do a practical tutorial about NetCDF file compression. Now just to give you a heads up, we're going to run this session in VDI because some of the utilities that we're going to use require more resources than the login nodes provide. So get yourself into VDI if you want to follow along with what we're doing. Now the first question we're going to discuss here is why do you want to compress your NetCDF files? And uh, well, the most basic answer to that question is, why not? It is best practice to co always compress your NetCDF files. They take up much less space and they can essentially be used in exactly the same way. It's possible that the access to the data might be slower, although not necessarily. It depends how you're accessing your data. Either way, it's not going to create a major cost to the analysis. So it's not going to be any, there's not going to be any real downside to uh, compressing your files, so that's really the way to go. But if you haven't already compressed your NetCDF files, you might end up having to do so in order to avoid exceeding uh, the allocated space that you've got. Or thirdly, for archival purposes, you may wish to archive the data and then you really have to compress it first. Klex's NetCDF utilities can be found in the Conda module we're going to use the most recent version, which is what we call Conda Unstable. And I've got up here the, uh, the lines that you need to do that. Module use GData 3 HH5 public modules and module load Conda Analysis 319.07. The reason we're not using the default module is because the default one at this point in time does not contain the latest versions of the utilities we're going to use. Okay, now when it comes to compressing NetCDF files, the first thing you might need to do is locate where your NetCDF files are. Many NetCDF files are generated using the naming convention of .nc with the suffix, although some models don't do that. So for example, the WARF model doesn't. Okay, so one way of doing this is to use the ncfind utility. The ncfind utility identifies all NetCDF files in a given directory. Now, if you already have some compressed NetCDF files and you want to just ignore them and find only the uncompressed ones, you should use the dash u flag. Dash u stands for uncompressed. Or if you want to find the compressed ones, then you use the dash c. Uh, flag. These commands will find the NetCDF files on the top level directory in which you are. But if you want to go into subdirectories recursively, you would use the dash R flag. Now, ncfind works by going through file by file in all those directories, trying to open it as a NetCDF file. As you can probably imagine, that's going to be really slow if you're going to search through a large number of files, particularly if the files you wish to identify are just a small proportion. So it can be really slow. So the fastest option would then be to use the Unix find command to identify all your NetCDF files and then to pipe the resulting list to ncfind to determine whether they're uncompressed or not. So, for example, if you know that your files follow the .nc naming convention and then you want to identify the uncompressed files, you can do the following, as I've listed here. Find iname asterisk.nc, type f, f means file as opposed to a directory. So that should find all files within that path and its subdirectories, which end with .nc. Then you pipe it through to ncfind-u, and that will tell you which of those are uncompressed. Now let's say you want to find files which both end with .nc, but also WAR files, which don't. And you also want to find specifically files that are larger than 50 megabytes, for example, and from the last 30 days because let's say you've been compressing your files all the time except for the last month. So then you would use the following 
the bottom command there with the find with the two I names in it, I name nc or I name wolf out. And it's got the size flag, it's got the m time, which is the time that the file was last modified as being within the last 30 days. And then you pipe that through to nc find. So let's maybe try that out now and we'll see what we get. Okay, so we'll do the first one first. Find. Okay, so it's found for me um, six NetCDF files which are uncompressed. Okay, now we'll try the second one. And at the end, what we'll do is we'll pipe that out into a text file. So we might be able to use that later when we want to do compression. And we'll just check what's in there. Okay, so it's exactly the same files are in there. Okay, so now you've found your NetCDF files. You have to work out what to do with them. That's what we call here data triage. Before looking at compression, you first have to ask yourself, should you be keeping this data at all? When you're creating so much data, you might realize you don't actually need all of it. Or even if you do need the data, if a copy is locally accessible, then you probably don't need to keep your own copy. So it's definitely worth doing this first and you'll save a lot of time later when it comes to uh, Con uh, compressing and archiving, just get rid of that stuff first. Now when it comes to uh, trying to use less space, the first thing you should try and do is to concatenate files. Concatenation is relevant when you have data sets that are split into many smaller files along a record dimension. A record dimension is for instance, basically a time dimension. It's one which is not limited, that just continues. There's no clear um, size of that dimension. And uh, in that situation, if you're dealing with something like that, you might be able to use tools like NCRCAT, which is one of the NCO suite of, of tools to join them into one single file. This is usually a more efficient way of storing the data because you're not repeating the grid information. Also, it's much more efficient when you're archiving data to store a smaller number of large files rather than a very large number of small ones. Now, the thing about utilities like NCRCAT is that they sometimes allow you to compress at the same time. So here I've got the command. If you're going to use NCRCAT and you do dash L5, so that will the L is telling you what level of compression do you want to give. So the fifth level of compression is the optimal one. And there, there you have it. You take in file one, file two, for example, and the output file at the end, and you can compress it as well. What's very important to remember is don't forget to delete your original data after you've done it. Otherwise, you're just doubling up. If you're not in a position to get rid of the original files, then just don't concatenate them. It serves no purpose. Okay, so now we're going to talk about compression itself. And how does NetCDF compression work? It's actually done via chunking. Chunking is a technique of dealing efficiently with large data sets. Rather than manipulating the entire data set at once, it's usually more efficient to break the data into smaller chunks, which can be manipulated separately. If your data is chunked more optimally, it will also take up less space. 
So that's how NetCDF compression utilities operate. Why this is really good is because one, you can continue to use the net, compressed NetCDF files as is. You don't need to decompress them first. And two, the degree of the precision of your data is not compromised by this process. Within the Conda package, there are NetCDF file copying utilities that can also compress the data, NC2NC and NCCopy. They utilize different chunking strategies. Neither one of them is clearly better than the other in every case, although be aware that NC to NC takes tw roughly twice as long. For convenience, the CMS team created a utility for applying these above utilities to entire directories and their subdirectories, and that's NC Compress. So when it comes to using NC Compress, our recommendation is before you try and run it on an entire directory, just try running it first on an individual file so you can see what it's doing and you can choose the options suited to your requirements. Okay, so when you run NC Compress followed by a file name, it will compress a file and put the output in a directory called temp NC Compress, which is inside the current directory. By default, NC Compress will keep your original copy just so you can check that it worked before you overwrite the original. That's what we are going to later call paranoid mode. In other words, just so you can check that uh, NC Compress is doing what you want it to, uh, you can do that. Now, that, it will, that will be done by default. Uh, later on, we'll discuss how you might want to activate paranoid mode explicitly. Okay, so let's try that out now. Okay, you see it's got this message that it tried by default to copy using NC to NC. That didn't work, so it tried it with NC copy instead. And you can see in the results that it told you how much space was saved, and it told you the average compression ratio is 4.7, which is not bad. Okay, so let's just check if we've got our results. NC doc documents, we have a tendency compressed directory, and there you've got that's your result, your compressed NetCDF file. Now, NCDF, uh, NC compress will, in the process, will compare your original file with your compressed file using CDO, um, a uh, NetCDF utility. Um, if you want to do it yourself, you want to check and see if uh, how well it worked, how well the compression worked, you can uh, use the cdo diff n command. So let's have a look here. Okay, cdo diff n. Commands sample c and commands. Sorry, in the okay, let's have a look. Okay, and it told us that it processed everything and it didn't mention any any diffs, no problems, so the compression was successful. Okay, now we're mentioning here that there's also the NCCMP utility that you can also use to compare the original file and the compressed file. Um, now, why am I mentioning NCCMP? The reason is that sometimes you'll find that CDO can compare dimensions in unusual ways. So just in case CDO doesn't work for you, uh, you've got NCCMP as an option. Pay attention if you are going to use NCCMP, use all the flags that I've mentioned here. I won't go into what they're about, but yeah, that's essentially what you're going to need 
to make the, the comparison. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at different options that you can use with doing NC Compress. Uh, first of all, we'll look at overwrite mode. So as we mentioned originally that by default, NetCDF will copy your, will, will save your compressed file in, in a different directory and will keep the original. And that's what we would perhaps call paranoid mode something that you know, you're nervous it didn't do a good job, you don't want it to overwrite the original. However, if you're happy fancy compressed to overwrite your original file, uh, and it, first it will check that the compressed file is not corrupt, you can use the, the dash O flag the, for overwrite mode. Now what's probably the best practice is to use both dash O and dash P for paranoid mode using them both at the same time. Why? Because what that will do is it will do, first of all, it will do the compression, put it in another directory, and then it will check against your original file if they are essentially identical. So it will copy over, it will overwrite your original file. If, however, it finds there was something wrong with the compressed file so that it doesn't match with the CDO uh, diff, so then it will leave it in the temp nc compress file and you'll be able to see that it's still there. So if you use both options, essentially it's pretty safe and it will save you the hassle. It will overwrite your original if everything went well. You don't have to worry about it. If something did go wrong, you've got, you've got it there and you can check it for yourself and see is it, was it actually a, a corrupted compression or was, it a, or was it a good compression and something went wrong with the comparison, meaning the comparison utility maybe had a bug or something. Okay, so let's try that out now. See, compress op documents, and we'll do sample two. Okay, so it did the it it did the compression, and let's just have a look in our current directory. We want to check did it work or not. So let's let's have a look in our in our documents directory, and we'll look using NC find for compressed netcdf files. Okay, so it's found it's found a few compressed ones, and among them is the one we just did, sample MO2. And if we look in our temp and compress, okay, only the first file that we did, that we only did in uh, default mode, is there. Okay, so now we're going to look at some more flags here. We've got the dash M flag, so max compression. So what, as you noticed, when it does the compression, it will tell you how many times um, the result is the ratio of the uh, result from the, from the original file, meaning how well it was compressed. So if you have a ridiculous high number, for example, let's say, it tells you that it was 20, a 20th of the size of the original, you've got good reason to think that something went wrong with the compression. So the uh, dash M, the max compression check, will tell you if you've got, and here the default value is 10, but if, you, if you've if you got a ridiculously um, high compression rate, you it should warn you about that, 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 that it didn't work. But you should know that this is, if you're using paranoid mode, then you really don't need to use this. And so you might just do dash M zero and it will skip the max compression check. Okay, another option you might want to use is, as we said, sometimes NC to NC doesn't work. And therefore you might want to use NC copy. Now, as it happens in our case, it tried NC to NC first and, that, and then 
as the default and then it tried an NC copy afterwards. But if you want to choose that in the first instance, you can use dash dash NC copy and it will do that. Okay, we've also got dash V verbose mode, so it will tell you what's going on. You want to have a good idea, uh, for example, if there are problems, what the problems are. Then there's also parallel mode. Now, parallel mode is relevant if you're doing multiple, compressing multiple files in one go. And it will only be, be uh, useful if you have multiple files in each directory that you're doing. Because it will, in parallel, it will use multiple CPU cores to uh, compress multiple files at the same time, provided that they're in the same directory. So be careful, check beforehand um, that the files that you're, that you're using, uh, you don't have, say, for example, a lot of directories with single files in them. Because then if you do parallel mode and it will use multiple CPU cores, uh, it's not gonna. It's just gonna be wasteful. It's gonna be only able to compress one file at a time, uh, and it's gonna be using resources unnecessarily. So make sure that that's relevant for you before you use it. And finally, the dash R to run recursively. So at the bottom here, we've got the full, fully blown command with all of the options here. O for override, P for paranoid, M for max compression, NC copy verbose, parallel, recursive, and then the path to the files. Okay, so let's try that out then. Okay, not necessarily in the order they were on the previous page. Okay, so first of all, it was going through every single file in every single directory and it was finding a whole lot of stuff that's not NetCDF files um, and ignoring those. And then it's going to specifically the ones that we want. Okay, I might just stop it here. This is gonna go for a while. We'll, we'll see a way soon where you can do things where, where it's not gonna to have to go through every single file in your entire directory. Okay, so what we just did now will highlight a problem that you might face, which is if it's going to go through every single file, um, you're going to, you have the potential that your, your command might time out. In fact, you might have lots and lots of files in all of your directories and it's going to go through every single one. And this process can actually take days or sometimes even weeks to get through all your stuff. Now a VDI session is only available for seven days, so it might not finish in time. Uh, and sometimes your VDI session might close unpredictably, so then you'll, you'll be stuck in the middle. So what should you do if your NC compress command times out? Well, you can try again, that's number one. But that's not such a great idea because what happens is if, if the reason why it's timing out is because it's checking every single file and every single directory and it's going through in sequence, it, it will, it's going to go through the same file list again. So if it might, it might never finish. So one thing you can do when you're dealing with a lot of files that, you need, that need to be compressed is to run NC Compress multiple times on smaller directories or subdirectories. So the command we've got here is we've done our standard NC compress file. At the end, what we've done here from the from the two arrow and one and then onwards, what we've done is we've piped from the standard error output into the standard output. So that means if there are any errors, you will see them on the screen and you'll see all your output on the screen, both the working output and the error output. And then we pipe that to a file 
and see compress out. That way, what you can do is you'll see what f the output from your your NC compress um, runs, and you'll see what errors happened, and everything will be included there. You can see what's done. So if you do time out, if you're expecting to time out, you can have a record of what was done and what wasn't done. I didn't really explain that so clearly. The basic reason why you want to have the two arrow and, and one is that it will display on the screen so you can see what's going on. And at the same time, it will pipe it out to this file simultaneously. So you can have a record of exactly what's happened. So from experience, I've seen that this is a way of keeping track. If you do this on multiple subdirectories, not just doing everything on the one big directory, but on the subdirectories, you can see what was what actually succeeded or not if, if in a case of a timeout. Another option, option number three, is remember earlier on we did a find command, we piped it out to NC find. I've got an example of the command we did earlier. So what you can do is making use of that file that you've that you've created with the list of uncompressed files, you can then run NC compress on all of those. And note over here that you've got the file list file list option here. So that will take uh, the ncfiles.txt file as a list and pipe it in and so that ncompress will, will do it, will deal with it. And then you can do tncompress out to see the output and you can see what was succeeded and what didn't. Now if it didn't complete, uh, you can or not everything was successful, you can use the ncfind command again to see what's not compressed. Or alternatively, you could do a search, a find command on temp nc compress. For example, so you can do find Type D at the end means that it's a directory, so it shouldn't have to go through every single file, it can find the directories. Okay, and there it is. Our, that shows you that there's something here that's not overwritten. So you can do that and you can see which, which files are yet to be overwritten. Okay, so that's basically the story when it comes to compressing NetCDF files. What about if you've got other files you, you need to compress, either because of your quota or um, you, you're archiving. So in that situation, you would use something like gzip. Uh, gzip is appropriate for non-net CDF files, or if you weren't able for some reason to compress your file with your net CDF file successfully, you can use gzip for that as well. Now what gzip does is it replaces your original file with a .gz file. Uh, there's a certain disadvantage here because you can't access a gzip file normally. You'll have to g unzip it first. Um, and once you've compressed your netcdf files, you don't want to gzip them because they're already basically as compressed as they're going to get. Gzip is pretty redundant and you're, it's going to disadvantage you because you're not going to be able to use the file without first g unzipping it. Okay, now when it comes to archiving, so you might need to tar your files. If the files are, let's say, um, smaller than 20 megabytes, then they say they don't work. that doesn't work very well if you want to archive it in mass data. So you want to bundle together your files and then you'll use, you'll create a tar archive. So to tar, so I've got the command there uh, with option zcvf. Z uses the gzip compression, C to create a new archive, V for verbose, so you can see what's happening, and F gives the file name, and then you have the file name after there. It's a .tar.gz file, and uh, if you want, that will, as I said, will both gzip compress your file and tar them together. If you want to do the opposite, and you want to untar it and gunzip, so then you use options Z as before for gzip. Instead of C for creating an archive, you've got X for extracting the archive and V and F for the same verbose and file name. So that's basically it. That's how you do um, 
That's how you do uh, untarring and g-unzip. And that's basically all you need to know about NetCDF file compression. Thanks for joining us. If you have any questions, you can send them through to CMS.